What is up, my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's just welcome to my channel. Now, welcome back. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. You will not be disappointed unless your taste level is lacking. Y'all, I said that one time. I probably said this before, but I said that one time and it's, this lady was like, way to try to get subscribers. You're insulting us. And it's like, girl, if you don't have a sense of humor, this ain't the, this ain't the place for you anyway. It's really not, okay? Happy Friday or Saturday. I'm not sure which day this video is going up and I hope y'all cannot hear Bella in the background. She has her entire fist down her throat. So I do have some life updates, I'll say for the end of the video. I have always been really open about my whole depression and anxiety journey and mama is going back on antidepressants. So I'll talk more about that in the end. And I might have to rehome Bella, which I'm doing everything in my power not to have to do that. So I also go into detail about that just to keep you guys updated um on what's going on but yeah aside from that without further ado let's just get into the mess okay because this story is definitely very messy so today we are discussing the case of or the lives of perry edward smith and richard hickok Perry Smith was born one of four children on October 27, 1928, making him a Scorpio. And he is born in the town of Huntington, Nevada, in the now abandoned community of Elko County. His parents, Florence and John, were both rodeo performers. And the year after his birth, they moved the family to Alaska to sell bootleg whiskey with John's father. John was reportedly very abusive to both his wife and their four children. And when Perry is just seven years old, Florence decides, you know what? I've had enough, baby. Enough is enough. It's time to go. And she packs up her belongings and the children and she moves to San Francisco, California. But see, Florence has her own little demon. And although the children do not suffer physical abuse at her hands, life is not exactly peachy with just their mother. She is an alcoholic and unfortunately dies from choking on her own vomit when Perry is just 13 years old. Afterward, instead of the children returning to live with their father, the children are placed in a Catholic orphanage and things go from bad to worse to even worse than that. Perry endures abuse at the hands of the nuns for his chronic bedwetting which continues throughout his entire life and a few years after being placed there he is transferred to a Salvation Army orphanage where he claims to have endured even more abuse and says that one of the caretakers there even tried to drown him. Unfortunately though it was unsuccessful. Later in his teen years Perry is reunited with his father and they move around a lot and by this time Perry is girl first of all we got way too much in down here way too much now why was y'all letting me get that crazy with the bronzer anyway back to the story by the time Perry is reunited with his father he's begun acting out quite a bit he has joined a street gang and he spends a lot of time in and out of detention centers for various petty crimes now, at the age of 16, he joins the U.S. Marines, and that was not the best fit for him. So after that, he joins the Army, where he serves in the Korean War. And now during his time in the Army, he is locked up on several occasions in the military prison, several occasions for the same offense, wandering around aimlessly in the Korean streets, picking fights with both Korean civilians and other soldiers. By the time he reaches age 24, the military is sick of his ass, okay? But despite his, his little record, they give him an honorable discharge. He crashes with an army friend for a while working as a car painter to support himself. And with his first few paychecks, decides to purchase himself a little a little motorcycle. And I don't know if he didn't take the, the time to, to learn how to ride or if it was just an unfortunate accident, but he has a terrible accident on the motorcycle and nearly dies. And it is said that he had lost control of the wheel in bad weather. Now Perry then spends the next six months of his life inside of a hospital recovering from the accident. And as a result of this accident, both of his legs are permanently disabled. This causes him to suffer chronic leg pain for the rest of his life. And to deal with said pain, he would consume large amounts of aspirin. Now, because of the terrible upbringing that he and his siblings had gone through, two of
of them opt to unalive themselves in their early adulthood, leaving just him and one living sister. And due to his toxic ways, Giles, she wants nothing to do with Perry. She cuts off all communication with him, basically just blocks him in real life. And his little frail legs do not stop him from being a menace at all. He is in and out of prison. And during one of his prison stints at the Kansas State Pen, he meets and befriends a man by the name of Richard Hickok. This guy. I cannot find like childhood photos of either of them. It's crazy, but that's the reason why I didn't put any. The two of them get along so well that when Perry paroles, Richard writes him begging him to violate his parole so that he can return to the prison and be with him. But it's not for them to just hang out like they used to. Richard has a plan that he needs Perry's assistance with that according to him would definitely be worth Perry's while. Now to give a little backstory to this Richard Guy. Richard Eugene Hickok was born on June 6, 1931, a Gemini. You know what they give. In Kansas City, Kansas. His parents were farmers who were able to provide their children a nice upbringing. They were by no means financially well off, but they were comfortable. Now, from what I was able to research, there weren't any truly traumatic events that had taken place in his childhood. His parents were just somewhat strict. In school, he is very popular and he plays sports. And after high school, he has dreams of attending college, but those dreams of his are crushed. When his parents tell him, we got a little money, baby. We don't have that much money. Like we cannot afford to send you away to college. So instead of going off to college after high school, like many of his peers, he has to get a job as a mechanic and basically reroute his future, find him something else that he would like to do. And to make matters worse, the year after he graduates high school, he is also involved in a terrible car accident that leaves him permanently disfigured. His face is also asymmetrical, as you can see. And at first, girl, I thought he was just born like that. I thought God had just threw two people together, girl. But it came with an accident. Now, according to his brother, Walter, this accident not only nearly kills the man, but it changes him. Despite all of this, he does go on to get married and he has a son with his wife. But girl, the one thing a man is going to have if he ain't got nothing else in the world is audacity okay Richard begins cheating on his wife and decides that he is going to leave his wife for his mistress and he and his new wife go on to have two more children together but this second marriage does not last long either Afterward, he falls into the scamming and fraud business and lands himself in prison where he meets his good friend, Perry. And the two of them basically become Brennan and Dale of the jail, okay? Now, while serving his time, Richard also meets and befriends a man by the name of Floyd Wells. And during their little prison pillow talk, Floyd tells him about a time that he worked as a farmhand for this very wealthy family, the Clutters. The Clutter family of six are farmers who live in Holcomb, Kansas in this huge, beautiful farmhouse. It has 14 bedrooms. It is surrounded by many acres of agricultural land. And 48-year-old Herbert Clutter had earned his fortune using new technology to grow wheat. And this breakthrough technology had not only gotten him a lot of money, it had also gotten him a lot of fame as well. It was very popular. Growing his wheat this way was considered a pioneer move. And so he was even interviewed by the New York Times. He and his wife, Bonnie, have four children children together, adults Beverly and Eviana, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, 16-year-old Nancy and 15-year-old Kenyon. So in the made-for-TV version of this story, Bonnie has postpartum depression with her last-born child and from that have become bedridden, but from my research, that was not actually the case and I'm not sure why they would make that how her life played out. However, she does have chronic back pain. And on the contrary, Bonnie is reportedly or was reportedly a very happy woman, very involved in the community. And she is also a member of the gardening club. Overall, the Clutters are a very well-known and well-liked family within their small community. But you know how small communities get down. Everybody knows everybody's business and rumors about their wealth and possessions spread far and wide. One of the rumors being that the family has a safe with $10,000 cash inside that they keep inside the home, which would be about $99,000 in today's 
today's economy. Now, this is a rumor that Floyd, of course, had heard because he had worked for them pretty closely. And during his little prison pillow talk with his cellmate, Richard, this had come up. The moment that Richard receives this bit of information, he begins devising a plan to rob them of their fortune. Knowing that he likely cannot pull this off on his own, he then enlists the help of his good friend, Perry, to help him out. Problem is, at the time that he found this out, Perry had been paroled. And so, of course, he begins his petitioning for Perry to get himself arrested, girl. Like, steal a piece of bubble gum from the register or something. Just get back here because I got a plan. Now, according to Perry, he didn't go get himself in trouble to return to prison for this plan. He'd actually return to prison on purpose for another inmate, Willie J., with whom he had had an especially close bond with on his previous day. Unfortunately for him though, the very same day that he gets back to the prison, his little prison bay had either been released or transferred to a different prison just hours before he had gotten there. And I mean, now that he's in there, he figures, you know, he might as well see what Richard is talking about with this money. Richard fills him in and immediately they begin devising a plot for when the two of them are released. And November 14th of 1959, they finally get the opportunity to set this plan in motion. The two men drive to the Clutter family home nearly 400 miles from where they had spent months Plotting. They wait around until they believe the Clutter family to be asleep for the night and then enter the home through an unlocked door. Now, only the two youngest of the Clutter family children still live at home and the two of them are asleep. Because of her back pain, Bonnie is sleeping in a separate bedroom than her husband because apparently there was a guest room that had a more comfortable bed and Herbert Clutter is asleep inside of the master bedroom alone. His room is the first room that they get to. They wake him up demanding that he show them where the safe is and that he opens it and gives them all of the money that is inside. Problem is, this safe inside of this home with over $10,000 cash doesn't really exist. When he tells them this, the two men become enraged, believing that he is lying to them. And once they realize or believe that he is actually telling them the truth, they become even more enraged because they've spent months planning for this big payday that is not going to happen. At this point, Perry and Richard awake the rest of the family, keeping them in separate rooms and tying them each up while they go through the house, completely ransacking, looking for money, anything that they deem worth stealing. And now the Clutter family does indeed have wealth. However, they didn't just have this ton of cash laying around and the cash is what they really, really wanted. So they don't come up with much at all. And this only fuels their anger even further. But instead of just leaving the clutter home at this point, they decide that it's best to eliminate the family so there are no witnesses and this would lessen their chance of returning to prison. Perry takes a fishing knife that they had brought along with them and he unalives Mr. Clutter. A quote from him. I didn't want to harm the man. I thought he was a very nice gentleman soft-spoken. I thought so right up to the moment I cut his throat. And if that is not bad enough, they then shoot him and hang him in the basement of the home. Afterward, they move to the room where Bonnie is bound and using the shotgun that they'd have brought with them they unalive her as well they then moved to 16 year old nancy's room where richard claims to have had to stop perry from essaying the girl before they unalive her the son Kenyon is last and they shoot him directly in the face they then flee the home with only 50 dollars cash a pair of binoculars and a small radio hours later a friend of nancy's arrives at the home making the gruesome discovery. She runs to a neighbor's house to call for police who arrive shortly after 10 a.m. A team of 18 are assembled 
to investigate the case and hopefully get to the bottom of who had done this and for what reason. They interview any and everyone who'd worked with the family or had any connection to them whatsoever. Classmates of the children, teachers, and school staff, Bonnie's doctor, literally any and everyone who had either a business or personal relationship to any of the clutters. They also promised award money for anyone who could bring forth any information that would lead to an arrest. Despite the severity of their facial injuries, all of the clutters have their caskets open at their funeral service with cotton covering their faces to somewhat mask the damage. And it is not until the crime scene photos are developed that investigators get what they believe to be their first clue. Under a UV light, a boot print is very visible. All of the clutters were barefoot at the time that they were discovered, so it obviously did not belong to any of them. Unfortunately though, this boot is quite common, and so there is not much else that they could do with it besides say, here's the killer's boot. So the photo is just filed away in case it could be later used as evidence. They have close friends and family come tour the house and make a list of anything that they notice is missing. All of Bonnie's jewelry is still inside of the home as well as other things that they would deem as valuable that should have probably been stolen if this was a robbery gone bad. The small radio is noted as missing, but with everything else of value inside the home that's still there, they begin to second guess this theory. They are unable to find that the clutters have any enemies. And so at this point, the case stalls. Now, several weeks later on Christmas day, the lead investigator on the case receives a call from his colleague stating that there is a prisoner who knew the Clutter family personally and also claims to have known the Clutter family's killers. Now, this prisoner is willing to tell them everything he knows or a little piece of that um, reward money and an early release. And it is none other than Floyd Wells, the old cellmate of Richards who had worked for the Clutters and had told him about that money in the safe in the first place. By this time, though, little Periwinkle and Richard had set off on a whirlwind adventure, a road trip all across the country, okay? Cashing fraudulent checks along the way. In Mexico, they pawn the binoculars that they had stolen from the clutters and decide to then hitchhike through California, eventually making their way to Nebraska, where they stay for a couple of days before heading back to Kansas City. They stay in Kansas for a couple of days before continuing their cross-country adventure. From there, they go to Florida and and then they go to Las Vegas, Nevada, literally everywhere. On December 30th, a month and a half after the Clutter family murders and about five days after their identity had been given over to the police, Harry and Richard are apprehended while picking up a package of personal belongings that they had shipped from Mexico. And among these personal belongings are the boots that they had worn that night. They had left the the print on the floor. Now, when they run the tags of this car that they're driving, they actually find that the car had been stolen in Iowa. They had just been everywhere up to no good, honey. Everywhere. They hit more more states in his six weeks than I had hit in my 21 years of living. After being caught, they are transferred back to Kansas where they are interrogated separately, both cracking under pressure and confessing to the Clutter family murders. However, Richard claims that Perry had done all of this himself and he had not physically harmed anyone. The two of them are charged and also charged for the car theft. Roughly three months after their capture, both are found guilty of all charges and both are given the death penalty. For five years, they live on death row at Leavenworth Prison. And during their prison stay, they go over the details, like sort of bragging to any and everybody that'll listen to them. Now, Perry later tells a friend of his from the army that he had literally seen one of the victim's heads split open after he had pulled the trigger. Very sick. Now, Truman Capote, I believe that's how you say his name, a writer who is well known for his work of Breakfast at Tiffany's, takes on the task of writing Perry and Richard's story, a book that he titled In Cold Blood. Now, this is where the story gets a little messy. During Truman's research for his book, he extensively interviews Perry and the two of them become really close, very close. And it is alleged that their relationship grew far beyond friendship. They say they had a little love 
love has a lockup situation going on. Allegedly. On the 14th of April, 1964, both men are walked to the gallows for their execution. Perry is 36 and Richard is 33. Now, morbid fact. On average, it takes a person about four to five minutes to be unalived from hanging. However, Richard takes 20 minutes. They'd asked him if he had any final words, and he says to them, quote, You are sending me to a place better than here. No hard feelings. Goodbye. Now, if you're going to a better place, girl, why did you hang on for 20 minutes? I digress. Now, Perry Smith had a little bit more to say when asked what his final words were. He has the nerve to say, I think it's a hell of a thing that a life has to be taken in this manner. I say this especially because there is a great deal I could offer to society. Excuse me. I certainly think that capital punishment is legally and morally wrong. He goes on to say that any apology for what I've done would be meaningless at this point. I don't have any animosities towards anyone involved in this matter. I think that is all. And that, that's what he had to say. Definitely ironic for what he is standing up there for. Like, sir. Both men are then buried in a cemetery close to the prison. Richard had opted to donate his eyes. And they were split between two patients that same day. Which, I'm all for organ donation. But I feel like that's a little bit creepy. And I feel like he donated his little eyes just so he could still see what's going on after he was gone. 47 years later, both men are Zoomed when authorities believe that they are linked to a crime that was committed similar to the Clutter family around the same time. Now, when they were initially arrested, both men were questioned about this other case, but they both denied having any involvement. They also passed lie detector tests when asked if they had any knowledge or involvement. So at the time, they were clear because of this, but now with the advancement of DNA, they wanted to test them to see if they, in fact, were responsible. Now, they are unable to find a match between the DNA of the men and the DNA found at the crime scene. However, till this day, they state that Richard and Perry are still their most viable suspects, regardless of the DNA not matching. There was a movie made about the book In Cold Blood, and Robert Blake played Perry Smith and Joe, they look exactly alike, like twins. And there have since been two other movies made about them. I haven't seen any of them, Joe, and I don't think I will. As for the Clutter family home, residents of the town wanted it to be torn down, but instead various other owners purchased it over the years. In 1990, a couple, Leonard and Donna, buy the house, living in it and charging $5 for people to come through and take tours of the home. Now, they claim to have only done so because so many unwanted tourists would come by the house just randomly. And they figured, why not be compensated for our peace being disturbed constantly by people who want to see this house? Rumors swirled that the teenage daughter of the family haunted the house. So this drove in a lot more tourists than people. People that wanted to see it and take pictures of it. But eventually the house tours are cut off because Leonard and Donna claim that they got tired of keeping their house in tip top shape, show ready, museum condition all of the time. I also heard or read rather that they were forced to discontinue these tours because they didn't have the proper licensing to conduct them in the first place. So I don't know which one is true. And that there concludes the story of these two knuckleheads and the unfortunate demise of the Clutter family. Ciao. Ooh, I was about to try to get out of here before I gave y'all the updates. So really quickly, uh, as for me, I've decided that mama gotta go back on into the presence. And the thing is, when I started the channel and I was working through my depression, it looked a lot different than it does right now. Like it was sadness. There were thoughts of like worthlessness and failure and just all of these bad negative feelings and emotions and stress, right? I don't have any of that now. However, it's very difficult for me to want to do anything now like I have had this video like I finished this research almost two weeks ago and I have yet to film it just because I just physically cannot make myself do it and I also want to get back in the gym physically I just have not been able to get in the gym and just I don't know I feel like I'd be really hard on myself like girl you could have you could have gone to the gym like I really beat myself up about not doing things that I want to do and uh yeah I recognize that it just looks a little different this time but it really is the same thing and and we're going back on the end of the press. It's hopefully, <sighs> child, hopefully that'll change. And as for Bella, if you follow me on Instagram, and I may have talked about it here on YouTube as well, but we've been having the issue of resource guarding. And if you don't know, let me just give you a quick Bella backstory. 
I got Bella in the summer of 2021, or well, the fall of 2021. And when I got her from the lady, a, a very kind, sweet breeder, she said to me, now she is a little boss. And I said, <laughs> I thought it was so cute because I was like, I'm a boss. <laughs> But I got her home and I got to see some of these little actions that were not so cute, girl. First of all, Bella would, let me scoot over so I can put some, some images in here for reference. So when I got her home, she immediately like claimed ownership kind of over Blue. She would groom him. She would lay on him all the time. And then she got to the point where she didn't want anybody to touch him, including me. She would swat me. She would nip at me if I tried to touch him. It was like, this is my baby. Don't touch him. She was very protective over him. When I would take them outside to walk, if a neighbor tried to pet Blue, she would go crazy. Like, don't touch him. Keep your hands off of him. We worked past that issue. But then she began resource guarding with Blue. So it went from her being obsessed with him and loving him to I still love him. He's still still my guy. However, you're a threat to my resources being attention. I could be holding her in my lap. If Blue enters the room, she'll like zero in on him and she'll put those little Frenchy ears back and she'll slowly lean forward like, don't you dare. And if he would remain in the room, then she would like lunge into an attack, right? And I would have to pull her off of him. Um, She began doing this with like treats, when it was time to eat, like she was literally any time there was something that she was getting that she didn't want him to, or she saw him as a threat to, Luke could be across the room eating his own treat, okay? Because I give them the same, they get the same everything. She would, she would do that. And now she could be sitting on the couch and Blue can come into the room and she'll zero in on him and like threaten him, right? And Blue is very patient with her. He would never really, really fight her back. Like it would just be him growling and like backing up. He's never gotten aggressive with her. And now, when I see her do that, well, when I see her do it anyway, I've always like kind of like broken her attention or I'll make her go to her room, her kennel. But now he'll like, if he sees her do it, he'll just leave the room because he just don't want the problems, girl. Or he'll go get a toy, bring it back, squeak it at her to try to like, I guess, give a peace offering, break the tension and then she'll play with him. And the other day, it's been about a week now, um, she attacked him and I'll put pictures, um, trigger warning if you cannot take like seeing the little animal hurt she attacked him really bad like it was so much blood I couldn't even see his eye like I thought he had lost an eye um so because she's the aggressor I always pick her up first I went to pick her up but this particular time blue kept coming at her like he tried to take her from me like it was so bad I've never seen that aggression from him so I kept her in her kennel for like the next maybe 18 hours just taking her out to walk her feed her until they calm down and then I decided to take them there take them downstairs to the dog park so they can be off the leash and run around um and potty and she walks up to blue and like sniffs his eye and he got so mad like and so aggressive and blue is just so sweet like he really is just perfect girl he perfect I don't care what nobody say he is the kindest sweetest most patient loving affectionate little dog I have ever seen in my life like he is just so so sweet so to see him like that I understand that he probably is at the point where he is fed up and because now it's a safety issue like I don't want her to hurt him even worse I don't want him to hurt her because he's obviously way bigger and stronger than her and shy he fed up and so yeah I contemplated rehoming her after the attack but then I was like I don't want to just put her off on somebody else what if they don't give her you know the proper help that she needs she obviously needs therapy okay and it's not just that she's aggressive to strange dogs like my friend's dogs she's not aggressive to but strange dogs she's very aggressive she always has been and I don't know what to do at this point so I hired a trainer we start Tuesday on Valentine's Day actually and this training company has great reviews and I'm just hoping that this works because if it does not she will have to be rehomed for both of their safety and child my peace, okay? Because it's not working. I won't just take her anywhere. I'm gonna get with the breeder first to see if they'll take her back or if they know somebody. Because I would like to put her somewhere where somebody feels confident working with her through her issues and that I could kind of keep tabs on, like keep in contact with. So that's where we're at. Y'all pray for Bella. Pray for Blue. Pray for me, okay? Because if something don't give, I'm gonna have to give her away. And that's my baby girl and I don't want to have to do it. I love her so much. So that's been very tough, but y'all, we gonna get through 
okay and that's pretty much it that's all i got i look forward to seeing your comments down below hearing your thoughts on the case if you have any i, I think i'm pretty sure i've talked about this in a video before because i've asked for help i know on a platform i don't know if it was instagram or here you got any tips regarding resource guarding and aggression in animals i'm all ears i'll keep y'all updated on how things go with her therapist i said i heard a trainer my sister was like girl not y'all going to family therapy i said yes i guess we are me and my daughter. Um, yeah. The trainer seems great. I had a, a long talk with him. And he feels confident that he can get her together. So we'll see. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Like, comment, share, subscribe if you have not. Peace. I had a nightmare that I filmed this video and did not turn the mic on at all. Now I'm a little scared. Ain't gonna lie. What is up, my YouTube family? Welcome. That was probably really loud. Yikes. What is up my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's just welcome to my channel. Now welcome back. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Button, child. I'm just trying to figure out why you had to wait until I started filming to suck on these balls. I mean, just gobbling them down. What is up my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's not welcome. It's just, what is it? <sighs> take three what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's not welcome jesus what do i say belly you suckling on your little knuckle down there is really throwing me off okay take four and i'll do what picking fights with korean siblings i was gonna say korean siblings them too with korean the two of them get along so well that when per well, I noticed when I first saw him that he looked like two people merged together and I was not sure why so I wasn't going you know I wasn't going to say nothing about it because I thought maybe he was born that way and it's not nice it's not nice anyway what am I talking about afterward he falls into oh girl I did not blend out the concealer above my top lip and y'all didn't even say nothing my goodness a guest room that had a more comfortable bed and Herbert bleh. under a UV light a bloody blue blueprint what girl I hope y'all can hear my neighbor's loud music that he had literally saw one of the victims. Well, he goes on to say, any apology that for what I have done would be meaningly, yeah. any apology for what I have done would be meaningly. Why can't I say mean meaningless? He goes on to say that meaningly, I said it again, what the hell? Meaningless. As for the clutter, uh, that they were forced to con, yeah.